Lord, we love you. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for this wonderful Memorial Day weekend. We know a lot of people are out traveling and, and getting away. Lord, we pray for safety and protection over them. God, we pray over our church family. Lord, there's a lot of people hurting. And God, we just lift them up. Lord, I'm reminded of, of the Stone family, uh, Miss Susan Stone. Uh, Lord, as she's with you and she's in the presence of you right now, we lift up Richard and his family. Uh, what a great ambassador for you and an, an, an ambassador for this church. Lord, we love you and we thank you for, for that wonderful lady and the time she had here. And we, we, we thank you for the, for the friendships and the relationships she's made. God, we just lift up Richard in comfort. Oh, we pray over this time together in the Word, Lord, that you condition our hearts to receive your Word this morning. God, that you're glorified in everything that's said. Condition the hearts. Let the anointing of the Holy Spirit flow and it find good soil. We give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to be just a little bit here. We're going to take some, some verses... In Jude, I'm not going to get real deep because there's quite a bit there. But I, I just want to remind you of what this is. This is apostasy. Or there's apost apostates that are in the church. And what an apostate is, is, is not a believer. And, and Matthew kind of makes this clear. And this is Matthew 13, verse 18. It says, You then listen to the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches it away um, so they don't hear it. Second one, uh, this is the one who sows along the path. right? And then the one that sows on the rocky ground, he hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet has no root in himself, but is short-lived. And when pressure and persecution comes, uh, because of the word, immediately he stumbles. That's who we're talking about. And then we're going to go into the, uh, the third one here, and this is also who they're talking about. Right? He says, Now the, the one sowed among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the worries of this age and the seduction of wealth choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. That's what we're going to be discussing. And now, what makes them an apostate is that they, they no longer follow Christ, but they stay and they remain in the church. So, if you, if you know someone that, that, that heard the Word of God and they, they believed it for a time, for a season, but yet now are no longer in the body of Christ, you, you can understand that. Right? Here's where, where the shepherds are being protective. It's the ones that have heard it and have rejected it, but yet have stayed in the flock, have stayed in the body of Christ. I should say the body of the church, not in Christ. These are the apostates. And this is who he's talking about, and that's who we've been studying about uh, last week. In fact, verse 4 uh, kind of tells you who they are. For certain men whose condemnation um, was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license for immor immortality, Im immorality excuse me, and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign Lord. That's who they are. So, Let's get into the text this morning. We're going to be in, in chapter, in the only chapter, but verse, verse 8. And it gets into the text. Nevertheless, these dreamers, these ones who do not have a foundation, they are just running amok. These dreamers likewise defile their flesh. They do not care about their flesh. Right? They, they abuse it. They have addictions. They are immoral. That's the first thing. The second thing is they reject authority. They reject authority. And it's, it's, it's good, nurturing, honest authority that they should be hearing and they should be 
uh, going to for reproofing and correction. They don't want to hear it. And we know that in the last times, people do not want to hear sound doctrine. That's the second thing they do. And then lastly, they blaspheme the glorious ones. And that's lowercase g. That is talking about spiritual things, angels. And we'll get into that a little bit here. And Zechari- uh, let's go to verse 9 before we get into <coughs> Zechariah. Yet Michael, the archangel, uh, when he was disputing with the devil in a debate about Moses' body, did not dare bring an abusive condemnation against him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. What does that mean? So, Zechariah kind of clears it up. This is exactly the encounter. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. That's Michael, an archangel, with Satan standing at at his right side to accuse him. And then verse 2 in Zechariah 3 says, Then the Lord said, uh, said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Not the angel. What he's getting at in this is no one should be rebuking anyone else. It's the, it's the Lord's place. It's the Lord's place to do that. He's saying even Michael himself, one of the highest ranks of, of the angels, was standing there and instead of rebuking Satan, which he did have their own fight, but he did not think it equal for him to say that. He said that's the Lord's job to accuse. And that what we need to understand is we need to be diligent and be aware, but we also need to understand that God is sovereign and God is in charge and God sees what's going on. God knows what's going on. Nothing uh, is secretive to Him. And He fights our battles. And even the angel, the high, one of the highest angels in heaven, understood the authority of God. And how much more should we in that? Now back into the text. What also this is saying is that these, these blasphemers, these apostates, don't know that place. They don't have that mindset. They go into accu- uh, accusing and they go into... Uh, blaming and they go into all kinds of, uh, of of heresies and things like that. They have no filter. They don't care. And and God is making a point that hey, even the angels are submitted and they have submission. How much more should we? And those are clear signs of who the apostates are in your church, right? The ones that 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 are just absolutely blaspheming and making a a mess and the ones that are not speaking truth and they you know and and again this is who they're dealing with in those times this is not a please please understand my heart this is a awesome church and we have wonderful people and by no means am i pointing out anyone i love everyone in this church and believe me if if i heard uh, if I if I had a sense of uh, there would being a, an apostate here, we would be dealing with things like that. That's not the case. But what I am saying is, we as a church body have to be aware in the last days and be sensitive to that and have a discerning spirit about ourselves, about what is truth and not truth, because that's the true battle that we're dealing with in this nation, in this world, is what is truth. We know what it is. It's Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Let's get back into the text. These people blaspheme anything they don't understand. Have you met that kind of person? I've had to work on this late, you know, Later in my life, as I've been growing in my marriage and in my, I guess, just my being a father and, and, and just maturing, at, at 20, I knew everything. Yeah, were you that person? Knew everything, right? And, and 
the older I get, the more I realize I don't know as much as I think I do. In fact, I'm learning that I don't know a, a whole lot about anything. Hey. Hey. Yeah. But when, I, when I've, I've, I've noticed this and saying this, like uh, my wife, she will be driving down the road and, and she'll ask me a question about something. And, and I used to immediately try, try to give her a response, whether I knew the answer or not. But I just, you know, blah, 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 blah. But yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. Now I'm realizing older in my life, I'm like, you know, I really don't know. It was such a freeing thing to, to just be able to answer her and say, you know, honey, I, I just don't know. I don't know. That'd be a good thing to know. That'd be a good question to ask so-and-so. Right? It's that wisdom and understanding and, and, and growing in your maturity and, and as a person. I'm not talking necessarily spiritually, but, but just being this, this person that says, you know, I, I just don't know. And sometimes that's very, very freeing. But what he's saying here is these people blaspheme everything. Anything they don't understand, they get crazy about. Maybe you know that kind of person that just goes off the handle and most of the time, i am be very honest, and some of you guys, most of you guys will agree with me. Most of the times, our arguments and our battles, whether it be with our spouses or our kids or our friends or even our church, most of the time, most of those arguments are based and founded on just not understanding. Just not having, a clear, uh, having clarity. And not really understanding the other person's view or opinion or stance. If we're honest with ourselves, most of our, our battles are, are just not understanding. And, and we got to be sensitive to that. And we got to go back to center. And that's what whole, the whole point of Jude is and the whole point of Second Peter is. As us as Christians, going back to center and saying, what is truth? What is truth? So they blaspheme anything they don't understand. They get out of hand. Um, and what they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals, they destroy themselves with these things. It's that they don't, they don't just, just act a fool. They act in, in outrage and they cause destruction upon themselves more than anything. But they leave a wake of destruction. I have family like that. That their reputation in town precedes them. Right? They go somewhere and you know that they've been there because there's a wake. You know, you know, like you, you're you driving the boat and there's a wake behind the boat and there's waves and they, they just leave a big wake. And that wake is destruction. And they know that. Sometimes it makes it hard to live with that person. And, and, and so you just, as, as believers, we live a simple life. As, as it's been said to us, as we studied in, in I think it was Titus, live a, 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 a peaceful life. Live a life with humility and submit to one another. These apostates do the opposite of that. And what Jude is trying to tell us is these are red flags. These are the wet ones we need to be keeping our eyes on and protecting ourselves from. Back into them. This is, Jude's, uh, this is Jude's stance to them. He says, Woe to them, for they have traveled in the way of Cain and have abandoned themselves to the error of Balaam for profit and have perished in Cohen's or, or Koran's uh, error or re rebellion. So what are these things here? Well, let's talk about the first one. This is Cain. We know Cain was the first murderer of the Bible. C Cain killed Abel, his brother, right? And the curse of that was, then he said, this is God, what have you done? For your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. God speaking to Cain, what have you done? Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground he says so now you are cursed 
and uh, 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 alienated from the ground that opens its mouth to receive your brother, uh, your brother's blood that you've shed. He says, for you, if you work the ground, it will never again give you its yield. And you will be a, a, a restless wanderer on the earth. So Jude is speaking to the apostates and saying, woe to you. This is going to be your curse. You're going to receive what Cain received. Then he continues, you know, he, he talks about um, the, uh, the Balaam, the error of Balaam. And, and I'll just tell you, this is in Numbers 20 through, 22 through 25. It says, Balaam was a heathen prophet who lived during the time of the Israelites' journey through the wilderness, following their escape from Egypt. Um, Balak, the king of Moab, offered rewards to Balaam if he cursed the Israelites. Balaam refused to curse them, but he persuaded Balak to corrupt them by getting them to marry the pagan Moabite woman. That's what Jude is talking about. They were cursed in that regard as this, from Balaam. He's saying that's what the apostates can look forward to. And then he finishes up with this, this cursing in the last part where he talks about, let me get to it here, the Kohens. And he talks about this. This is in number 16. 250 prominent Israelites. This is uh, number 16 too. 250 prominent Israelite men who were leaders of their community and representatives in the assembly. This is what they did. They rebelled against Moses. It didn't work out well for them in that regard. Again, Judah's reiterating these are the curses that are, they're going to look forward to. The apostates are going to look forward to. And then we'll finish up these are the ones, these apostates are the ones who are like dangerous reefs at a love feast. Right? And, and, and they are hell-bent on destruction. They feast with you, nurturing only themselves without fear. They are waterless clouds. Waterless clouds. Clouds, we need clouds to produce. There's water in those clouds. We can see. I wish they would drop some rain, but these apostates, you'll notice them. This is the sign that you should see. They don't produce any rain. And he continues, carried along with wind. The trees in the late autumn, they're fruitless. Twice dead. Pulled out by the roots. It reminds me of Jesus cursing the fig tree. They just don't produce fruit. This is late autumn, and they should be at the best point of harvest, and they just don't produce we know Christians and fellow believers because they produce fruit. Their lives produce fruit. And that's how we know a brother and sister in Christ. And we're going to finish up. They're wild waves of the sea foaming their uh, shameful deeds. Wandering stars for whom the blackness of darkness ha is reserved forever. There's an eternal punishment set aside for these who are coming into the church and, and trying to destroy the body of believers and detro destroy the work of God. And again, it says this back in the early part of the book. These, are, these have been condemned early on. They've been understood early on who they are and their purpose. So this is what it means for us. And we're going to finish up in 2 Timothy 3. And this is the time we're in. Bring it all back to the circle here. He says... For the time will come when they will not tolerate sound doctrine. That's how we know the apostates. That's how we know there will be a time that's come, and I believe the time is now, when they will not tolerate sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, will multiply teachers for themselves because they have an itchy ear for something new. There's nothing new under the sun. They're looking for something different. They're looking for something else other than the Word of God because if they stand on the Word of God, it doesn't work for them. And then lastly, they will turn away from hearing the truth and will turn aside to myths.
But here's our charge, church. But as for you, as for Western Heritage Cowboy Church, be serious about everything. Be aware. Be diligent. Be sober. Be diligent for your adversary. The devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Church, be serious in these last days about everything. Endure hardships. That's what we're enduring. That's what we're doing, enduring now. There's people that are, are passing away from a coronavirus. There's, there's persecution from everywhere. There's things that are happening in our church. It's saying endure hardships. And he continues, do the work of an evangelist. That's a big thing. He says, this is what we need to do. Be serious about everything. Endure hardships and preach the gospel. That's good. That's not just the preacher's job. It's just not the, that's the associate pastor's job. Our job is to equip the saints. Equip and empower the saints with sound and true doctrine so they, they can go evangelize the world in the last days. That's our charge. And then lastly, it says, do the work of an evangelist and then fulfill your ministry. Everyone here, listen to my heart, everyone here has a ministry. Everyone is called by God for a purpose in His kingdom. And his, his glory is poured down on you. And His ability for that job will flow through you. Your ministry is important in the last days. Some of you never thought that you would be where you are in the ministry that you're in. But God wants more. In the last days, we're to evangelize and fulfill our ministries.